Good afternoon everyone, welcome to Michael's Media School. We trust you've enjoyed the Easter break. On your seats today there were two items, the one's just a copy of our latest product and service guide. If you've grabbed a copy of our catalogues before you might notice these are a bit different. It's 36 pages long and a lot more comprehensive and aside from the products there's also a lot of information about the Media School and the fine art and the, the, uh, the lab, the pro lab upstairs so we encourage you to take it with you, it might be a, a useful resource going forward. The other item is just a short expression of interest. We're hoping that this workshop today with John will uh, get you all excited about panoramic photography if you're not already. So if you're interested in potentially uh, taking part in a, in a course or a class run with John at Michaels, we're looking to, to add this to our media school offering, so please just complete that little form and leave it on the seat, I'll come and collect them after. If you don't have the form for any reason, there's a few more up here, so feel free to fill it out there at the end of the session. Today, we have a very special guest with us to present on panoramic photography. John Walkington has been uh, offering professional photographic services for over 10 years now and has been a, and is a true expert in the production of both artistic and, uh, and commercial large-scale panoramic images. As you can see at the front, we have an enormous one printed in our fine art department. Feel free to come and take a look uh, at the end of the session. Um, John continues to push the boundaries of, of what can be achieved in this medium and he's become recognised as one of Google's top panoramic photographers as well. Please make him feel very welcome. Welcome, John Walkington. Thank you very much, Mark. I'll just dim the lights down here for a little wee bit. It's a real pleasure to, to come and speak at Michael's. Uh, as, as Mark was saying, that uh, I'm a real uh, addict uh, of panoramic photography, and I've been doing a little bit of work uh, with uh, Peter, the owner of, uh, of Michael's Cameras, as well. And uh, he's uh, got a little bit of a belief in me, and uh, we've been uh, working together on some interesting projects. And he thought that it would be good if I came down and, and presented a little bit on this just to whet your appetite. Uh, I'll try not to go into an awful lot of detail, but we're going to cover a few things. And some of the issues that were covered in the last two seminars on the Wednesdays, which were HDR and raw workflow, those are part and parcel with what I do. So I won't really talk about those, but uh, you can rest assured that we use pretty well everything in our tool book uh, to create these panoramic images. So I've just called it Going Wide, an intro to Panos, and uh, as you can see there's a shot of me standing on the roof of Council House in Perth with my panoramic rig, and that same camera is uh, over here, uh, and that is the resulting file, which is a mosaic of a little over 200 pictures. So that's a gigapixel panorama, but what I like to try to cre create with these things are these large mosaics, and much like the one in front of you here, but they should work as an individual photograph. It shouldn't just look like an sticky tape together mosaic. It should work as a single image but just happen to have an awful lot of detail. So that's one of the styles of panoramas that we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, so a little bit about me. I've spent the first 15 years of my career in the explosives industry testing explosives and I've traveled all over the world and part and parcel of the explosives industry is documenting your work and using scientific photographic techniques. So I've used all manner of scientific gear uh, high-speed motion pictures, ultra-high-speed framing cameras, million frame per second stuff, uh, 16 mil motion up to you know 10,000 frame per second, flash radiography, street cameras, million frame per second, ultra-high-speed framing cameras, all sorts of stuff. Even crazy things called light bombs. So lots of lots of weird background in explosives, which touched on photography. So I kind of think about this in a bit of a scientific capacity. I don't claim to be the world's best photographer or the world's best artist, but I know my technology and so I can make do with a lot of these things. Uh, I've spent the last decade in Australia as a commercial photographer and panoramic photography has been a big part of that for the last three, four years. Uh, simply stated, I'm a panorama junkie. I just love these things and uh, so my work is a bit of my hobby and I've certainly met a few other uh, panoramic addicts in, around Melbourne and I've got uh, Barney Meyer here helping me out. He's going to shoot a panorama of the room today, a spherical panorama. So at some point uh, we'll uh, turn the lights on and he'll probably move his camera over to the center and we'll give that a go. Um, lastly, as uh, Mark said, I've been doing some work with Google. I'm what's called a Google trusted photographer. Uh, Google has ventured into the panorama field with their Street View product and now they've commercialized Street View and it can go inside businesses such as Michael's Cameras and I'm one of the Google trusted photographers in Melbourne so that's one of the areas where I've commercialized my panoramic work. Barbie as well is a Google trusted photographer. So we get into the meat of the matter. What's a panorama? 
Well, the classical definition is a wide image, usually two to one aspect ratio. So two images wide, one, or sorry, two units wide, one unit high. That kind of is what people think of for panoramas. But there's a lot more to it. Uh, and you can certainly take any image that you shoot and just crop it to a panoramic aspect ratio. And of course, our modern digital cameras have got so much detail, just cropping it to make a nice wide picture, a two to one or a three to one or even a four to one, you can print them huge. You know, uh, for instance, there's a, there's a digital wallpaper sample on the side of the room here, and that's just a one frame out of a 12 megapixel camera, and it's got a whole, a whole wall. So you can do an awful lot with just one frame. But we get to the next part. A panorama can be a mosaic of many images, or it can be shot with a special panoramic camera. Now, Andrew's going to pass around a panoramic camera. You can all have a little bit of a look at it. This is kind of the last of the film cameras, and it's a rotating panoramic camera. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. But uh, have a little look at that, and uh, that's how people used to shoot images on film. They were very restricted, and they were very expensive, and they were very hard to use, and honestly, I've never used one. <laughs> I don't think I've, I've only met one person, I think, who ever has. Um, so what would we want to do with the panorama? Why, why do we want one? Um, personally, I think it's a pleasing image format. I mean, uh, television has moved somewhat panoramic. Our modern TV sets are 16 to 9 aspect ratio. Uh, movie films are, you know, like Panavision, they're 2.35 units wide. So the panoramic image is pleasing to the eye. Originally, TVs were kind of square. They were 4-3 aspect ratio. And uh, those have gone the way of the dinosaurs. So things that, you know, life has moved wide. It's, uh, we've got two eyes across our head, so we see in, in a wider than taller sort of point of view. So they're a pleasing image. We use a panorama to show a wider field of view. So we have a wide angle lens, but maybe we want to go a little bit wider. Or maybe our camera's got a normal lens, but what we're presented with is an image that just needs a little bit more width. So maybe we make a mosaic. Um, or maybe we want to do gigapixel panoramic work. We want to yield more detail using many images. So these are all sorts of different, different ways we can skin this cat. Uh, maybe we want to show a huge space, even behind the camera, the floor, and the ceiling. And that's what Barney's going to demonstrate. So he's going to capture a panorama with a circular fisheye lens. So that lens, in one frame, sees from floor to ceiling. And he'll shoot four frames around, and he'll capture the whole sphere only with a little missing patch underneath the tripod. It's very small, like a 40 centimeter by 40 centimeter square patch would be the only part of the room missing. And of course it's just carpet, so you can just clone that right in. So that's how you shoot a spherical panorama. So what do we need to shoot a panorama? Well, historical systems, you know, the days of film. Panoramas have been around since uh, basically the, the early days. I mean, they, they were shooting them ages ago. It's been a very popular format. Uh, there's modern systems that are now in the digital age, and interestingly, every smartphone can now basically shoot a panorama. Uh, we're going to hook up this iPhone that I've got in my hand a little bit later, and we'll shoot a panorama in the center of the room. But, uh, I mean, probably half of the people in this room have got an iPhone. There's a panoramic mode built into the operating system of the iPhone, and there's a hundred different little applications that can do a little bit more with panoramas. Pretty well every point-and-shoot camera that's sold downstairs has a panoramic mode. Some of them work with taking an image and another image and another image and you stitch them with software. Some of them stitch them in the camera. And some of them have some really fabulous modes where they take thin slices and they blend a whole, like hundreds of slices together. And that's the way the iPhone works now. So there's a, an awful lot of ways to create a panorama. As far as the historical systems, um, we're going to talk about the, 19, or sorry, the 1848 Cincinnati panorama. The, the world of photography basically started with the daguerreotypes. It was the, the first mass-marketed photographic format, and I believe that came to the market in 1839. And only nine years after that format came around, and that was a very difficult format, using mercury vapors and polished panels and... I mean, you had to have a lot of money to have one of those cameras. That was, a, that was a really interesting profession in their days, and a lot of these guys gave themselves mercury poisoning and died. You know, so they suffered for their art. Well, there was a set of uh, two photographers that had a studio in Cincinnati, and they had an 8-inch plate camera, and they shot an 8-panel panorama of the Cincinnati Riverfront in 1848. This image has got so much detail in it 
It's basically a, a gigapixel panorama today. It's been restored by Eastman House and in conjunction with the University of Rochester using uh, uh, microsco microscopic uh, microscope techniques. And it's just got tremendous detail uh, in it. So, I mean, people were shooting mosaic-based panoramas with conventional one-frame shot cameras right back since the beginning of time. Uh, the Apollo astronauts even shot mosaic-style panoramas on the moon. Every moon mission, those guys had a camera strapped to their chest, a Hasselblad 6x6 medium format. There's a, a, obviously not one that went on the moon, but Peter has one in the, in the museum just outside. You can see it. There's uh, the, the commemorative edition of those uh, Apollo uh, panor uh, uh, st well, not panoramic cameras. They were regular cameras, but the astronauts, they just rotated around and they took a panel that way. And those images can be stitched, and I'll show you a little sample of that. And then lastly, we've got circuit cameras. And circuit cameras are rotating cameras. And the one that's been passed around the room, that's a little miniature 35 mil format circuit camera. But uh, in the early 1900s, Kodak was making them, and they were big wooden box cameras. And let's just uh, take a little look. We'll show you one. So let's just get over here. And so here we are. There this one. I get this. So here's a circuit camera. So that's Reg Lambert. He was a, a well-known photographer in uh, Western Australia from the 1920s all the way up into the 1960s. And he had a Kodak 10-inch circuit camera. Now this thing used a vertical aperture in two, two spools. It basically unrolled the film from one side to the other while the camera rotated with this gear-like clockwork. And that's, that way it exposed a thin slit as it moved around, thus making a complete panorama. Now beside him is a modern photographer, Reg Lambert, and he has a 70 mil version of it, and the version I passed around is very similar, but it's a 35 mil version. So these things have been around a long time. We just don't see them anymore. It's, it's kind of as an art form sort of died off in the, uh, in the 50s or in the 40s. It used to be very common to uh, shoot huge wedding gatherings with these circuit cameras, uh, military regiment group photos, industrial group photos. It was a real common form. And uh, the big wooden box ones, they came in from a six inch roll film size all the way up to these monsters that were 16 inch high film. And the negative that this would produce would be about two meters long. They were like this. They were the gigapixel images of their day. And uh, the photographers that had this gear, they could command a very good, uh, good income. You know, it was really interesting. Um, to make the prints from them, they used some sort of a contact printing system. So your, your print was the same size as the negative. Um, now, I'm just going to show you one of these samples here of a circuit camera photo. So let's just get over to here. And all our red samples. Bear with me while we work on a couple of multi-headed things here, so let's get this. Now, conveniently, let me see if I can make this full screen here. That image there was shot with Reg Lambert's circuit camera. And I've actually had that negative in my hand. And the negative is one meter across. It has an immense amount of detail. Unfortunately, there's no service bureaus in Australia capable of digitizing that. Uh, all the film scanners uh, today can't handle anything that large. We'd have to get that thing shipped off to Eastman House in the United States to get it digitized. So we digitized it in sections on a flatbed scanner, but it doesn't do the negative justice at all. But interestingly enough, a little pet project of mine has been documenting the face of change of the Perth landscape. So that picture is taken from the tower of what, at, when this was shot in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s. We're not 100% certain the date of the picture. But it was shot from the tower of the Perth Observatory. And I now go to that observatory on every trip that I make out to Perth, and I reshoot the image. And conveniently, we'll just layer it in. And there's the new skyline layered in on top of that. And so I've now shot that in one and, um, oh, that's why it might be a six or seven hundred megapixel image, and then I shot it again last year at about two and a half gigapixels. But basically, those pictures are lined up, and you can see there's not too much left in Perth that's the same. We'll zoom in, you can see that the state parliament is still there, which 
which is here. Now there's a bit of a layer of transparency obviously here. Let's get this. And we can turn that off and on. Getting to that. I've got to zoom in here. Let me zoom out a bit. Bear with me here. I can adjust my glasses every time I do this. Ah, here we are here. So that is the Perth uh, or the Western Australian Parliament buildings here. And you can see they existed way back in time. But the trees have all grown up. And uh, there are an awful lot of changes. And in between the two high-res panels that I've taken, new buildings have shown up. And uh, when I get out in Perth in about a month's time, I'm going to reshoot this image again. So we'll have another point in time. That other panoramic photographer, Phil Gray, that I pointed out with the 70 mil camera, he shot this in the 1980s as well. And again, a completely different uh, uh, look. And that picture is in his book, which I will pass around. There's a whole series of things. So Reg Lambert's old circuit camera pictures were found by Phil Gray, and he went to all the spots and reshot everything in 1986. And slowly, I'm working through it and reshooting everything again in 2011 onwards. Uh, although getting access to some of these places is quite difficult now. But it's been a bit of a pet project of mine, because I like to use these high-resolution images to compare things. And it's just a, the then and now photographs that are you know, a real popular thing for me. Yeah, let's get back to our slides here. So, uh, there we are. again, the circuit camera's there. Let's get to key out here. So now, so at, at the, the last dying gasps of the film panoramic cameras, there's been a few machines out here. There's the Fuji 6x17. Now, that's a standard still camera that shoots a wide aspect ratio frame. A very high-end camera. I've never used one myself. I tried to find a photographer that owned one to bring it to show here, but I couldn't round up anybody. The last guy I knew who owned one sold it used. There's a few famous photographers in, in Australia that use this format. The most uh, well-known one is Ken Duncan. Um, and he's got a gallery down in Docklands, I believe. Uh, he's been shooting on these uh, Fuji 6x17s for years. And uh, that's an awful lot of film emulsion. It produces a big, beautiful print. But it's a conventional camera, so it doesn't shoot behind itself. It's not a rotating camera, but it's a panoramic aspect ratio. Uh, then uh, in the late 90s, Hasselblad came out with a 35 mil camera called the X-Pan. It's since been discontinued, but it was quite a small, uh, similar in aspect ratio to the big Fuji, but used 35 mil pictures, or 35 mil film. So it shot about two or three frames wide at a time. Uh, they're uh, quite a desirable little camera. I'd like to own one at some point. There's a bit of an oddball one called the Noblex. I've never used one, but it's a rotating camera, but it doesn't rotate beyond 135 degrees. It kind of has a mechanism inside it that rotates. I've got some links to stories about all these things that I'll put together in a little info package that we'll be hosting on my website later. So if anybody really wants to follow all this sort of stuff up, we'll be able to take care of your interest. And then lastly, uh, Sites has the Round Shot series. And that has survived into the digital age. So we saw that one sample, uh, Phil Gray was using a 70 mil one, and I just handed the 35 mil one around. So that uses basically one strip of 35 mil for one picture. And the camera rotates it, and there's spool, a take up, and a, and a supply spool inside that. So now, in the modern systems, what do we have now? Well, we've got digital circuit cameras. You can replace the film in the back of one of these rotating cameras, and Sites continues to make them, and another company called PanelScan makes them. And so they use a linear array. Instead of a square chip like we have in the back of our digital cameras, they've got a line array. And they rotate that. It's like a flatbed scanner rotating around the room. And they, you know, they're, they're common, but very expensive. Law enforcement likes to use them. Uh, there are many, many digicams that shoot a 16.9 image now, because televisions are 16.9. People decided to make cameras that shot that. It's a very pleasing aspect ratio. It's not quite two to one, but you know, we'll call them panel cameras. Now, a lot of digicams don't actually have a 16.9 chip, but a few do. Panasonic's made some. But a lot of cameras, even if they have a 4.3 aspect ratio chip, have a 16.9 format, because these 16.9 displays are everywhere, so we use those. And then, of course, there's special panel modes on almost all new cameras. Some of them even use a high frame rate video mode, so they take a lot of slices to build the image so they can handle the issues with motion and uh, misalignment because a lot of slices makes for a nice averaging picture. And the iPhone's built-in panoramic mode uses something very similar to that. And then, of course, the last one, shoot and stitch. Well, that's really, that's what controls the market right now. 
Uh, if you really want to get a high-end panorama, like the ones we've got on the floor here, or these little planets that have been passed around the room, or the big ones that are outside, the New York City one here, well, those are shoot and stitch. And um, there's a lot of hassles with shooting and stitching. You've got to take a lot of pictures, and you've got to put them together, and it's hard. But you can deliver really high-resolution files and beautiful images. The downside, obviously, motion. If, if there is motion across a blending scene when you're shooting and stitching, you have to deal with that. So that's the world of Photoshop. But there are some very advanced stitching programs out now, uh, including Photoshop Elements, which is taught here at Michaels, that uses all sorts of interesting, they call it content-aware blending. And so that it can blend around the motion and can do a really great job. So we'll walk through a couple of those samples as well. Let me just get through the slides here as really quick and it will go on. So, yeah, shooting panels with gear you already own. Well, you probably can shoot them on your smartphone or your iPhone. As I said, pretty well, every one of these cameras has a panel mode. And in general, it's kind of important on small uh, iPhone type cameras because they don't have a wide angle lens. So you're usually stuck with about a 35 mil lens on these things, which is, you know, it's not a normal lens, but it's not a wide lens. It's kind of an in-betweener. So if you can put a few frames together, you can then get a little bit more coverage. And of course, that's one of the main reasons why we shoot panels. We want to get a little bit more coverage with the gear we've got. Well, the gear we've got today is an iPhone, you know, or a smartphone. Uh, you know, I think the standard stats are there's been more images shot on iPhones, you know, in the last year than the history of recorded, you know, photographs. So, you know, it's the phone you've got. So use it. Panoramas are just another little, uh, little uh, tool in your, in, your, in your toolkit to try to make the most of that camera that's usually sitting in your pocket. Uh, so let's just talk a little wee bit about how we want to shoot one of these things with an iPhone. So I'm going to do a little bit of a demonstration here. So we're going to unplug this, and we're going to plug in over here. And then let's capture <coughs> an iPhone. So let me just move this over to here. Can you, Barty? Can you see that? Okay. You want me to pop it at the Oh, I think you're okay. Now, I'm going to turn the lights up as well. Okay. So, let's get this thing working here. Now, hopefully this is going to work here. I'm going to... There we go. Okay. Now, we're going to use a little program on this iPhone. Now, this is one of the newest iPhones. It's got a little funny gizmo in it that makes panels kind of fun to shoot. So... What we're going to do is we're going to place it on here. Now you can see the image on the screen there that we're doing. We're going to press the go button. Be careful not to knock the phone over. There we go. It's going to do a little countdown. And conveniently, it rotates on its own. So I don't have to do the rotation. All these phones have got a buzzer in them for, for silent ringing. This one's got a bit of a resonance. It'll cause it to spin. So some guy figured that out in the bar one night, made a 99 app that shoots panos. And here it is. How cool is that? Puts me out of a job. Now, unfortunately, it gets a bit stuck when it gets over the edge here. And I don't know, it's like this going okay. Oh, yeah, it's getting a little stuck there. It likes a nice hard surface. I mean, it's not a professional system. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> anyway. So keep in mind now, that's using the hardware that's built into an iPhone. It's got a buzzer in there. And so we can do that. Now it's probably going to fall off the table now. Oh well, here we'll just we'll cheat and let you get the last one. Anyway, suffice it to say, it should work better than that, but this is the, whatever. Anyway, so here we go. It's produced a panorama in the room here for us. And here we are. Now, it's not a real wide one, or sorry, not a tall one, because it's, again, these are not wide angle lenses here. But you know what? It's captured, you know, where we are. There's me looking like an idiot. <laughs> but that's what it's done. It's done the full 360 built in. And uh, so that's a fun little app called Cycloramic. Only runs with the little vibrating mode on an iPhone 5, though. So if you need to update your phone, there's a good reason. Good fun. You look like a real rock star when you pull that out at a party. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll just move this out of the way. Now, the other thing I'll show you is just the built-in iPhone app to shoot a panorama. So, again, you can see the screen here. And what I want to talk about here is 
misalignment with something called parallax. Now, this is the thing you're always going to be fighting when you shoot a panorama. Now, what is parallax? Well, when we rotate the camera, as you can see behind me, we're seeing the various parts of you, but if I have this young woman here in orange, and there's another woman behind in pink, parallax is this. If I move the camera over here, I'm seeing a little bit more of the woman in pink. Now I move the camera over here, I see a little bit less. If I don't rotate the camera to shoot my frames about the optical center of the lens, which in the case of a phone, the lens is on the bloody side, if I don't rotate it carefully about that center, I'll put parallax in, into the images, and it'll make it a little harder to stitch. So when we're shooting a panorama, we don't want to go like this, because we're going to put parallax all over it. What we want to do is we want to shoot it, rotating it about the lens, like this. Now, it gets a little bit of vibration in it. That only matters if there's going to be some near objects and some far objects in your panorama. If it's nothing but landscape and sort of grass or sand or something in front of you, you'll never notice the stitching errors in just a, you know, just a field or anything. So you can shoot landscape panoramas of the distant mountains. You can just hold your camera up like you always do and just tap, 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 tap. That will always stitch well. But if you shoot them with a wide-angle lens and you've got some subjects that are close to you and some subjects that are far, the classic one that always gets my father is he's on a cruise ship and he's taking a panel of the harbor from the deck of the cruise ship and he's got the railings in the picture. So all the distance of objects line up perfectly, but the railings have stitch errors because of parallax. That's why we have these crazy pano ads. They enable us to line the camera up on the no parallax point. And that's the, that's the, the, the magic behind panoramas. But conveniently, the iPhone has this little mode that you don't even have to worry about it too much. So let's go here. We'll tell it to do a panorama. So here it is. I'm going to hit start. And I'm going to take this purposely all out of whack. But it's going to take 20 or 30 slices to make this panorama. Let me just rotate it. Breaking every rule here. This is not how you should be rotating your pano camera. Try to keep it vertical when you do it. And it's just building it up, and I just watch it here. And I'll go all the way over here to mark. You can do up to about 180 degrees with this. So I'll hit stop, and then we'll just take a look at it. And here we go. And there you go. Built in. Uh, oh, unfortunately, I don't know if I can zoom. Mm, hang on a second, I think we might have lost something here. Let's get ourselves back on here. Get it back on. Uh, okay, here we go. Anyway, it's not bad. There's probably, you know, 20 or 30 individual images in there. So, pretty well any iPhone that's been built, as long as you run the new operating system, which is free, you can shoot these things, and they're pretty good. Uh, I just did a vacation in the United States, and I didn't bring a camera with me other than my iPhone. And I'm a bloody photographer. You know, I made do with this stuff. I shot everything with panos on the iPhone. If you want to, and you want to stitch them, you can shoot individual frames. If you want to get pedantic about it, you can try to shoot it without rotating the camera too far in front of you. you rotate it like that. You know, so those are kind of the tricks. Now, let's take a look at how would we shoot it if we had just a digicam. Well, here's a digicam I bought recently here for my wife. So, again, it's got uh, a reasonably wide-angle lens. Now, unfortunately, we can't do that live in front of us here. But if I just uh, set this up here, and we like to normally shoot with the camera in portrait mode, so we get a little, we, we sort of get the most of our not-so-wide-angle lens. Because when we shoot these panels, we're trying to get a wide picture. So we're going to shoot multiple frames in portrait mode. And so by having the camera on the long axis up and down, well, then we just do the sweep this way. So you can shoot them this way, but it won't be as tall. And then you might have to do two rows. Doing two rows is a lot harder. Uh, these ones, you know, there's 150 pictures in that one. It's a disaster. You don't want to touch that until you really get into this and take a course. But a single row panorama usually works quite well. It's quite nice to shoot them in manual exposure so that all the frames will blend together. But if you don't have manual exposure in your camera, just shoot it in auto. The, panic, the, the stitching software does wonders these days. So let's just see what we got here. Now that's a little underexposed, so we've got to raise our ISO up here. Hang on a sec here. ISO. Oh. I bought this for my wife and I barely know how to use it. Uh. Let's see what we can do here. Uh. <coughs> I think I'm going 
be terribly underexposed here. Why is this stupid ISO command on this? <laughs> uh, menu. Oh, here we are. Okay, so we'll raise the ISO up here to 800 for this, and we should be able to get something. Okay, here we go. And then we rotate it a bit. Now, notice how I'm trying to rotate it without moving it around a bit. I'm rotating it just on my hand here, I'm trying to get it close to where it needs to be. So we'll, I'll stitch this one up later. We'll put it on the website so you can have a look at it. So that's how we might do it with the Digicam. Now, lastly, we still don't want to spend any money, but maybe we have a proper, you know, a digital SLR camera. Well, the magic of panoramas is this novel point to try to get things to stitch well, it's basically the front of the lens, eh, plus or minus a couple millimeters. But you can have about 10 centimeters of air, and with the software today, it'll still stitch. So we do a really stupid thing. We hang a weight off the front of the lens. So you do this, and I quite often just put a little something on the ground like a coin. I think I got a coin in my pocket. And I've got some I shot out in the street from my house the other day, I'll demonstrate. But basically, this is a fisheye lens now. It's not a, yeah, a professional photographer might own this lens. It's a 15 mil fisheye. I've had it for years before I was even shooting panoramas. And uh, so it shoots a nice wide image top to bottom. And uh, you can shoot a panel with this in about eight frames around. So you basically, you know you want to be above where that coin is on the floor, and you got your little plumb bob here, so you just take your pictures. And I find if you rotate it 45 degrees, and then another 45, another 45, it does the trick. And even if you don't have a fisheye lens, you could use a regular lens, you'll just have to shoot a bit more. Quite often these cameras, digital SLRs, come with a kit lens, which is like an 18 to 55. Well, 18 is pretty wide. You shoot about 12 images around, you get a full 360, and uh, just string a little weight, and then you know what it is. After you do this for a little while, you get the hang of it. Because the trick is you want to avoid just going like this. You're trying to rotate about this axis, so you walk around with your feet like that. So that's basically what it's all about. Now, we won't bother shooting one right in here. Barney's going to shoot one with the proper plano head now. And I'll get some next, uh, let me just set up here for you. So this, this is an 8mm lens, too shy. So that's a real special lens. That's and pretty well used for panos. It's got a ring which mounts onto it, and then it's got a very nice little head. I love it. The Nagu Ninja R1. Um, and so it rotates around this Nagu point of that lens. I'll just check the exposure now. Just sit still. That's using a crop sensor camera, and I believe that's an 18 megapixel camera. The resulting file is about a 55 megapixel file, so pretty high res, suitable for a big print. And uh, uh, Barney's produced some huge canvases uh, with, uh, with with files of that size. Um, so that's that's kind of how we can shoot economically and capture the whole room in a panorama. So we'll talk about just the types of panel heads. So that's called a ring style pano head. It's a very affordable product and it mounts to the lens. So it solves a lot of the alignment problems. Now this other head over here, which is mine, is a fully adjustable one. It's a dinosaur and hard to use. If you really want to shoot spherical panoramas, a, head, a ring style head is the way to go. If you want to use a lot of different lenses and shoot a lot of different styles of work, then a fully adjustable head is a good way to go. And then lastly, there's robotic heads. And uh, Peter Michael owns one of the robotic heads, and there's a few panoramas uh, on the wall back around here that he shot with his Giga, uh, Gigapan Epic head. Uh, so, putting panels to use commercially. What do we do with these things? Well, 
I mean, uh, we might want to use them for what's called a panoramic tour and deliver them online. So I'll show you a quick sample of that. We might want to use them for high resolution social media tagging. And I'll go show you a quick sample of that. And we might use them for fine art. You know, we might just do them because they're just plain fun to do. You know, it's, uh, that's kind of what, how I got started. I was doing these things with my dad with prints and sticky tape and a pair of scissors. <laughs> so, and, uh, which is no different than what the guys did with the Cincinnati 1848 uh, uh, panel. So, let's just take a look here. Uh, I'm going to show you a little sample of a panoramic tour. So, here we go. Let's make this full screen here. Now, bear with me while I try to find my buttons. Okay, so here we have some panoramas that were captured with a pretty well identical system that Barney has. And you can see that we're seeing a full 360. And we're now presenting it as if it was us standing there looking. So this is called a virtual tour. And uh, oh, this is just up in uh, near Yara Glen. And we've got some interactivity on this, so we can click here. If I can get my mouse somewhere here. Here's my mouse. I can go click on this, and that'll take us to the pond image. And there we go. Now we're looking over at the pond, which is actually here. And as you can see, we can look up at the sky, and we can look down on the little jetty that we're standing on. So we've captured the whole 360. So that's sort of what we do. Now, interestingly enough, that's kind of what Google does, and kind of what I'm doing with Google. Albeit, this isn't a Google one. So let's take a look at what uh, a Google presentation is. So we can go up here. Let me see if I can get my screen. Let me see what we got here. I can't quite see the top of my screen, unfortunately. Oh, well, here we go. Okay. So here's a Google panoramic tour. So this is the RMIT Swanson Academic Building, which is just around the corner from us here in the city. And the Google system's not as fancy. We sort of have to press and drag to move it around. doesn't do any auto-rotation. But it's just like Street View. So we walk around using these arrows. And we will walk. Uh, we'll walk out of the street here. And we can make that full screen as well. Oops, hang on a second. Where's my full screen button? Oh, there's full screen here. And conveniently, Michael's Cameras has also got a Google tour. So if you go to their website, and I'll hopefully be able to show that to you quickly here if I can see the tabs. And you can explore even in this room on the Michael's Cameras. So here, we're walked out onto the street here. We go over to here. And then this little double headed arrow will take us to Street View. And now we're on the panoramic pictures taken by the Google car. And conveniently, there's a little bug in it and the RIT building didn't exist. So, interestingly enough, Google shot literally billions of panoramas, and now with individual photographers such as Barney and myself, we can go inside commercial premises, shoot panoramas, connect them up to Street View, and let people explore buildings online, shops, and restaurants, cafes, and all sorts of things. So that's uh, you know, kind of interesting stuff here. Uh, I wanted to just give you back to the uh, Cincinnati panorama. There's a website, which is uh, 1848 Cincinnati Library, and these are the eight panels of those old daguerreotypes. And they're in deep zoom resolution. You can explore those, and I'll put those links all up on my website after the talk. So give me a day, probably, for that. Um, now, let's get back to our other topics. So we've got showed Google. We showed another tour outside of Google. Oh, let's show um, a high-resolution image. So let me see what we've got here in high-resolution. Mm. I seem to see my screen. Bear with me here. Yeah. Well, I don't think I gotta worry about that. Uh, let's get back to our slides here then. Oh, so I guess just as a bit of an introduction. This whole idea of spherical panoramas, Apple created the format called QuickTime Virtual Reality in the mid-90s. They don't really involve themselves in the market segment anymore. Google's kind of taken over the, uh, the mantle for that. Um, and of course, Street View is this just massive worldwide database of panoramic images. Uh, in the social tagging, these high resolution images have got so much detail that in a crowd environment, you can find your face in the crowd. So there's a couple different companies, FanCam and um, Gigatag, that are integrating these things into social media marketing campaigns. So for instance, at some of the cricket games over the uh, Christmas break, in Melbourne, 
the guys came out with uh, long focal length lenses and fancy panoramic heads like that, and they shot the crowd panoramas, and they tie that into face tags so that you can go find your face in the crowd. And the idea is people want to look at these images, say, I was there, get involved, and advertisers want to, you know, hitch their uh, wagon to that, uh, that train, and a uh, way to get clicks. Uh, in the United States, Major League Baseball's been using the Gigatag system, and NFL, National Football League's been using the FanCan system. Uh, the Gigapan system, the Gigatag is interesting that individual photographers can also create these campaigns. The FanCam system is a big commercial and very expensive. And lastly, Panos' is art, and we brought some along. Uh, we got Panos' is signage, Panos' is fine art, and uh, these are called Little Planets. And uh, I'll actually just show you how that one's assembled. And that's kind of where my real interest is, but art's a little hard to commercialize, so you've got to do a bit of commercial work as well. But uh, we didn't really dive into the stitching software too much because that's pretty complex. But that is basically the meat and potatoes behind that image. There are about 150 images that make up that mosaic. So they're shot in HDR, they're raw files, they're processed, and they're all put together into this sort of pattern. And you can see there's blending errors, like there's a guy's legs are cut off over here. So that has to then get worked on in Photoshop and probably took me about a solid week of post-production to create that image. So that's panels as art. And uh, anyway, hopefully I've whetted your appetite for a little bit about what you can do with these things. Now, yeah, open for questions. I might actually just step in because uh, John's said he's uh, in no major hurry. If anyone wants to have a chat, John's happy to hang around after. Yep. Um, so as people are leaving, I'll just mention a, a quick mention of what's coming up in, in the coming weeks. We have more guest presenters coming to the media school. Next Wednesday will be Suzette Nazai. She's one of Australia's leading college photographers, specializing in, in newborn, toddler, and, and children's photography. So I'm sure that'll be a useful one. The following week, um, renowned Australian documentary photographer Michael Coyne will be joining us again presenting a session titled To Witness and Communicate, uh, which will give great insight into his work and tell some of the dramatic stories that unfolded behind the scenes. For any further sessions, please visit the online schedule at michaels.com.au slash free seminars, or better yet, join us on Facebook and we'll, uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated each week there. Thank you all for joining us today. One more round of applause for...